Hi, this is Dr. Richard Bernstein with our uh, June 29th, 2016th uh, seminar. Um, we uh, give you first my usual warning that the answers to your questions are really educated guesses uh, that may be totally incorrect. Remember, I'm not doing a physical exam. I'm not taking your full medical history. So I'm making certain assumptions, and based on those assumptions, I could be totally wrong in what I tell you. So don't uh, take them too seriously. The answers are mostly for the benefit of the entire audience. Uh, we have two special subjects today. The first one addresses the question, What's happening with generic metformin? And indeed, something is happening. As you may know from my videos and teleseminars, that as a rule, generic metformin is not nearly as potent as the brand name glucophage. And as I've said before, I don't even know who the manufacturer of glucophage is, uh, I have no relationship with them. Um, they won't even give me samples. <laughs> but that stuff works. And the generic stuff does not work very well. But we're running into trouble when patients are trying to get generic metformin now. Uh, previously, they would have to battle with their insurance company and they would pay a higher copay. Now I'm getting phone calls from people who are not my patients telling me that their endocrinologists or family doctor refuse to prescribe brand name glucophage because there's no difference between that and the generic metformin. And these people are asking me, can you show me some literature of studies that prove that generic metformin is not as effective? Uh, so that I can prove it to my doctor. Trouble is, I can't, because I'm probably the only one who's observed this, because I look at my patient's blood sugars. I look at, for any given patient who calls me uh, to email me his blood sugar data in a, that covers a two-week period, I might, in that one phone call, be looking at 75 or 80 blood sugars. So I get to see what's happening very rapidly. Not only that, my patients are used to having level normal blood sugars, and if uh, and when they had switched to generic metformin to save money and their blood sugar shot up, they saw it right away. Well, other doctors are not attempting to achieve either normal or level blood sugars. They don't notice this. So it's a real dilemma. I have not worked out a solution to it. Um, you can uh, uh, show them uh, my video or something like that. We do mention it in my book, Diabetes Solution. So you can uh, submit that as evidence, but of course one person's testimony is not good evidence. And I don't know a way around it. Now, while we're on the subject of metformin, I should point out uh, a new application that I had not mentioned in my book. Actually, there are two applications that I do not think I mentioned in my book. Uh, one has to do with blood sugar uh, irregularities during the menstrual cycle in women. Uh, frequently, in the week before a period, women, women who are diabetic especially type 1s, may experience either high, low, high blood sugars every month or low blood sugars every month. Uh, some of them will have unpredictable blood sugars every month. And I found that by giving them metformin at the uh, maximal uh, recommended dose and giving them the timed release, glucophage XR, I should r withdraw the word metformin and say glucophage XR, uh, probably 
a uh, thousand milligrams in the morning and a thousand milligrams at bedtime, that we s- seem to stabilize the blood sugars uh, in the week before the period. Some period, some people have erratic blood sugars during the period. Again, this will s- seems to stabilize it. Uh, there may be exceptions, but I've had pretty good results. Uh, so I recommend that very highly. Uh, it, and I've only used it by giving it to them all month long uh, because uh, it's sometimes hard to tell when one week before the period is going to begin if your periods are irregular or whatever. So uh, we usually give the glucophage XR uh, for the whole month and I'm not afraid of doing that because uh, there are apparently other benefits. It's being used uh, in Europe uh, supposedly as a treatment for cancer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the one shortcoming, of course, is that for some people, and that's rare, it can impair vitamin B12 absorption. And if you take it with a Tums pill, a little bit of calcium every with every metformin tablet, you overcome that B12 malabsorption. Um, the other application that I have not discussed before is for growing children. Uh, children who are in a growth spurt usually display erratic blood sugars. And when I put them on the glucophage XR, lo and behold, we get a straighter line. We get closer to straight line level blood sugars with the help of the glucophage. And what we do is we start it slowly. We take, um, and this, this the, how to start it is explained in my book, but we might take uh, one tablet uh, after breakfast uh, for a few days. If you don't get any diarrhea or uh, uh, digestive discomfort, um, we then take another tablet after dinner and uh, then the next time we try one, we might take it uh, on arising instead of after breakfast because it's, it may be more convenient to take it then. And then we take the second one at bedtime. And eventually, we're taking two 500 milligram tablets on arising and two at bedtime. And so we can see that glucophage can be of value to people uh, who are growing and uh, to women who are menstruating. Um, Our next special subject for today is what to do if you're using liquid glucose and you cannot afford it. The uh, liquid glucose uh, bottles that I've been recommending are very convenient, uh, a good size, uh, have good taste, and uh, uh, unfortunately cost about $3 per bottle. Many people can afford this. Insurance will not pay for it, but uh, there is a way around this, and that involves purchasing powdered glucose or dextrose, which you can buy on the internet uh, uh, the, the prices run around $12 for a pound, uh, $12 for a half a pound. Uh, there, there's competitive prices out there on the Internet. And you want it pure glucose or dextrose. The, they're identical. They're both the same product. And you want to dissolve it in water. Now, the technique for dissolving it in water to get what concentration and how to do it, we're going to go into great detail in a video so you can watch me doing it. Uh, But those of you who want to experiment uh, can uh, probably do just as well as I can. You just have to uh, uh, attain the same concentration that you get in the bottles that you can purchase in the drugstore. And we'll tell you how to do that. Um, One other little trick uh, when you're making liquid glucose... Glucose is a great nutrient for bacteria. They love it. And uh, you uh, uh, mix some in water, and overnight uh, you might start growing bacteria. 
uh, in fact, we had an episode in uh, one of my cars where I left um, uh, a bottle of a glucose tolerance test drink in the car and it was there uh, for several months. Uh, it was a car that I didn't use very often and bacteria grew, produced um, uh, carbon dioxide and uh, made ethanol uh, and uh, the carbon dioxide pressure built up and the cap popped and the <laughs> glucose ended up all over the car. We had a little explosion. So uh, we don't want bacteria proliferating in uh, a bottle of the liquid glucose you make. Well, if you made it up fresh every day, uh, you wouldn't have that problem. But if you're going to keep it for a while, what I recommend is you take a medicine dropper full of vodka and put one dropper full in each uh, a bottle of, small bottle of liquid glucose. And uh, it won't make you drunk, uh, but it will act as a preservative. Okay, now we're going to go on to this month's questions. Are there antibiotics that do not elevate blood sugars? I do not know of any antibiotic that elevates blood sugars. In fact, uh, if you have a bacterial infection, uh, it's likely that your blood sugars will go up and the antibiotic that works on that bacteria will bring the blood sugars down. So if anything, uh, properly used antibiotics should have the effect of lowering blood sugars that are elevated by bacteria. They don't raise blood sugars. In Diabetes Solution, it was written that Lantus insulin is not recommended because of an affinity its molecules have with cancer cells. The Tugeo insulin is made by the same company that makes Lantus. The ingredients appear to be the same also with a higher concentration of insulin per volume. It does to JO also have the same interaction with cancer cells? Absolutely. And uh, aside from uh, the fact that, uh, that any version of Lantus can uh, um, enhance uh, the growth of cancer, uh, the Tugeo is a high concentration Insulin. I don't remember whether it's U300 or U500, but the more concentrated the insulin you uh, use, the harder it is to measure a precise dose. So the uh, uh, very concentrated insulins uh, would be good for very obese people who are severely insulin resistant, so insulin resistant that one unit uh, might also uh, only... Uh, raise them a tenth as much as uh, the nominal uh, effect that you would get in a non-obese person. I've read that if you eat a very low-carb diet, you can falsely fail the oral glucose tolerance test. I was reading that you need to eat 150 grams of carbs a day three days before the test if you've been eating very low carb diet. Well, 150 grams of carbo a day is not physiologic. In fact, uh, it's only uh, in recent years, let's say, since after the Second World War, that people had access to so much in the way of high carbohydrate that they could get 150 grams of carbo a day. So I don't think that there's anything physiologic or normal about doing this, and I don't know why you should um, artificially raise your blood sugar uh, or consume a lot of carbohydrate to take a glucose tolerance test. Now, the same person who asked about the glucose tolerance test says that it's... Be, 
it's the reason they called her she was uh, pre-diabetic after she was had a gestational diabetes well I think that's a good call because I would call every person who's had gestational diabetes pre-diabetic because at least 50 percent of them become diabetic eventually so uh, just having the gestational diabetes is uh, for me is enough to say pre-diabetic might not be enough for other doctors and that's why they did the glucose tolerance test but uh, I think that's enough uh, to say you're pre-diabetic you have uh, the card stacked up against you. Do you think artificial sweeteners, especially those in diet soft drinks, can cause insulin resistance? Absolutely not. There's a lot of nonsense on the internet. There are many doctors who uh, spout garbage when it comes to diabetes. Uh, and when it comes to diet, and this is just a lot of nonsense. There have been some studies um, indicating that uh, foods that taste sweet may affect uh, which organisms uh, proliferate better in your own microbiome. And apparently, uh, the taste uh, doesn't matter whether there's real calories behind it or not. Now, I don't know how valid this study was because there are a lot of uh, studies that have been exaggerated and where the data has been uh, uh, misinterpreted, etc. But there's some indication that that's a possibility. But that's not just artificial sweeteners. Okay, let's see what we have next. This person takes 100 milligram a carbos with meals. Any comments? My A1C is 5.3, but trying to do better. Now, a carbos is something that I may not have mentioned before, but it's very interesting. <clears throat> it's uh, an alpha. Uh, glucosidase inhibitor. It inhibits the action of the enzyme in our digestive system that breaks down complex carbohydrates into simple sugars. Um, and complex carbohydrates are things like uh, bread and potatoes. Um, uh, it's not a problem with high fiber vegetables because we really can't, we don't have the enzyme for breaking those down. So um, uh, the acarbos was generated by the ADA to offset their high carbohydrate, high whole grain bread diet. They're giving you um, products that, the, uh, that this enzyme will rapidly convert to glucose and they're giving you a drug to prevent that conversion. I don't know why they're doing this. Maybe it's because they get advertising dollars or something, but it makes absolutely no sense. Not only that, um, the acarbos is not 100% effective at preventing the conversion of these foods to simple sugars, number one. Uh, number two, it causes flatulence. So if uh, your friends don't mind you flatulating around them, take the acarbos. But uh, <laughs> that's the story. I see no reason why uh, anyone on a low-carb diet should take acarbos. You shouldn't be eating any bread. You shouldn't be eating potatoes. You shouldn't be eating corn, etc., etc. And those are the things uh, that require the acarbos. And as I said, it'll only be partially effective. It'll cause bloating and it'll cause um, uh, flatulence, uh, self-generated methane. Um, let's see what else we got. 
can seem to both lose weight and keep my blood sugar high enough overnight to stay asleep, uh, to stay asleep through the night. I must skip the nighttime snack to lose weight. What suggestions do you have? I do not take insulin. I take one Genuvia. Well, first of all, I'd recommend that you read my book, Diabetes Solution, because it goes through many tricks for gaining weight, losing weight, um, and um, uh, controlling blood sugars. Now, the... Uh, there are pros and cons to Genuvia. Some early studies showed that Genuvia uh, increased the incidence of uh, coronary artery disease and heart attacks. Recent studies show that it supposedly does not. There are studies that show that a, that a number of drugs that are used to treat diabetes also foster beta cell replication. And the class of drugs uh, that includes Genuvia has been shown to foster beta cell replication. So that might be a good uh, use for the Genuvia. Uh, its direct effect on blood sugar is very minimal. But if it really fosters beta cell replication, it may be of value. Um, there are uh, I don't know that um, it should be necessary to take a, ni a nighttime uh, snack. Uh, uh, th this is something that the ADA doctors have been recommending ever since I was a kid. And um, as far as I can determine, it usually causes problems. Uh, the only time I give nighttime snacks to people are kids who require frequent feeding because they get hungry. And uh, many of them uh, get hungry at bedtime and we'll give them a couple of slices of cheese and maybe cover it with a half unit of insulin um, uh, simply because they're hungry. Uh, but there's no metabolic reason for giving people snacks. Uh, the ADA ball game is to give... Uh, uh, diabetics excessive amounts of medications that lower their blood sugars, such as insulin. Uh, they give them basal doses that are far beyond true basal doses and force people to eat. So they're forced to eat all day long and then they're forced to eat a snack at bedtime. Shouldn't be necessary. And if you're having trouble losing weight, you shouldn't need a bedtime snack. The game plan should be to take the right to be on a low carbohydrate diet and take the right combination of medications at the right times of the day to keep your blood sugars level. And this is covered in the book, Diabetes Solution. Um, by the way, the oral medications that are most effective at and safest at uh, lowering blood sugars are uh, glucophage, uh, Avandia, and Actos. And the Avandian Actos, you have to uh, make sure that you don't retain fluid. And we talk about that in our videos and seller seminars. I would like to chew gum after meals to help my digestion. But xylitol and other sugar alcohols seem to raise, uh, uh, in, in chewing gums, seem to raise my blood sugar. Do you know of any good alternatives like stevia gum? I've never heard of stevia gum. Uh, xylitol has one nice advantage in, in that it's an anti-metabolite for the bacteria that inhabit the mouth and um, can reduce tooth decay and uh, gum infections and whatnot. But the game plan is not to chew gum all day long to, or not, not to chew multiple pieces. If uh, it helps your digestion, Chew one stick of gum at the end of the meal, the one gram carbohydrate xylitol gum, not the two gram. And uh, to give you an example of how much it would raise blood sugar, um, 
that uh, it'll raise you about two thirds as much as one gram of glucose would. Now, uh, one gram of glucose will raise my blood sugar um, by eight milligrams per deciliter, but I only weigh about 110 pounds. Someone who weighs 150 pounds, one gram of glucose would raise them, let's say, six milligrams per deciliter, and the xylitol would be two-thirds that, so that would be four milligrams per deciliter. So if one stick raises you four, it's no big deal. You could get away with it. But don't keep chewing another stick and another stick. So uh, that's what I would suggest. What are your thoughts on nutritional ketosis from an, for an insulin-dependent endurance athlete with uh, uh, late-onset autoimmune diabetes? So this is like uh, type 1 diabetes. Now, uh, ketosis has been shown to be very good for seizure disorders and there even have been there's been at least one report as at it being a treatment for Alzheimer's disease that um, uh, ketotic uh, dietary regimens uh, may slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease but uh, I see no reason uh, for trying to bring about ketosis uh, uh, for a marathon run. Uh, the only way that I know of to uh, uh, beat uh, the wall uh, is to carry liquid glucose with you. Now, they don't talk about the wall anymore, but back 25 years ago, marathon runners would pass out after a certain number of miles. And uh, no one knew why it was a mystery until someone measured blood sugar and found that they were hypoglycemic. And even though they weren't diabetic, they uh, were becoming unconscious from hypoglycemia because they used up all their stored glycogen and could not convert uh, a fat to energy uh, rapidly enough, or maybe they didn't even have enough fat. Uh, but you can... Uh, the average... Uh, adult can only store in his entire body about 300 grams of glycogen, um, mostly in the liver, but also some in the muscles. Now, 300 grams is about 1,200 calories. That's not going to last a, month, a, a marathon. So you're going to run out of glucose, you're going to run out of blood sugar, and you can easily pass out. And to play games with diet, uh, some doctors claim that you could build excess glycogen in your liver. You can't. Uh, you'll only store a limited amount. So you carry the glucose around with you in, in the liquid bottles. Um, and uh, if, you, if when you practice your marathon, you check your blood sugar uh, every so many minutes and and play around with the amount of glucose you're going to drink, you can work out a routine that gives you pretty predictable blood sugar levels. Uh, you, your routine may turn out to be that during the first 10 miles you take uh, uh, a half a bottle every 15 minutes, this is a hypothetical routine, every 15 minutes. And during the uh, second 10 mi miles, you may need a whole bottle every 20 minutes. You know, you, you work out a routine, and then uh, you'll have this routine and the stuff that works real fast. Even better than that routine would be to check your blood sugar every so many minutes and uh, make a correction overcorrect 
uh, maybe by 10 or 20, and then check again in, say, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but there's no magical dietary regimen. It just, it, it ain't no such thing. You should have enough protein in your diet so that your muscles are well-built and strong, uh, but that's a separate issue altogether. For type 2, when is it time to start insulin, and how do you know what to start with? My husband is taking metformin, 1,000 milligram twice a day, repaglinide, which is prandin, 1 milligram at dinner, and glimepiride, 4 milligram twice a day. Well, this person should certainly read my book because they're using medications that I recommend against. Uh, The prandin and glimepiride are both uh, work like sulfonylureas and uh, uh, have been shown repeatedly, A, to cause hypoglycemia if not used properly, to uh, foster beta cell burnout, thereby making the diabetes more severe, and three, uh, increase uh, the incidence of heart attacks. So the two products that should never be used, and uh, the the and generic metformin shouldn't be used. You should use the brand name glucophage. So uh, it all boils down to read diabetes solution and uh, uh, go step by step the way it uh, tells you. I have a. Uh, friendly doctor who will write the prescriptions for you. Next question. Can a low-carb diet sustained normalization of blood sugars reverse already established atherosclerosis conditions? A very good question, and no one's asked that before. Most of these questions have been asked over and over. Um, And... uh, I'll tell you what my experience is. I had evidence of severe atherosclerosis when I was a, when I was uh, a teenager. Became diabetic at age twelve, and um, I also had uh, evidence of severe dyslipidemia. I had what are called xanthalasmas, or cholesterol warts on my eyelids. And uh, this you only see with um, uh, very severe dyslipidemia. I also had um, uh, arcus senilis, which uh, I've shown several times on my videos. It's a gray arc over the iris of the eye uh, that uh, I called it Arcus senilis, but what I had was Arcus juvenilis. It's uh, rarely seen in children, but commonly seen in old people who have atherosclerosis. I also had um, a cardiac stress test where my blood pressure did not go up, indicating that my heart was weak, um, etc. Um So I probably had severe atherosclerosis. But um, perhaps uh, unwisely, starting a few years before I started controlling my blood sugars, and let's see, I was, I guess, around 35 when I started controlling my blood sugars, um, I started exercising. And by the time I was controlling my blood sugars, I was exercising at above my theoretical maximum heart rate. And I've been exercising at above my theoretical maximum heart rate with essentially normal blood sugars for, uh, let's say, uh, um, 40 years or so. Let's see, from 1969 to uh, 2009 would be 40, so it's about, let's say, 46 years, 47 years. And I had a um, a coronary artery calcium score several years ago, and the score was 1. 
So somehow I had reversed pretty severe coronary artery disease. And it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't just the low carbohydrate diet. The low carbohydrate diet enabled me to have normal blood sugars, which enabled me to have a decent lipid profile. But on top of that, I was doing this very strenuous exercise and uh, the mechanism by which that cleans out the arteries uh, may be still a mystery. There have been several speculations uh, printed, but I don't know for sure how that works. Anyway, it's a combination of things. It's not just the low-carbohydrate diet, but the low-carbohydrate diet is essential. I also point out that if you have coronary artery disease and if you're unfortunate enough to have soft plaque, this strenuous exercise can break the plaque loose so that it blocks uh, an artery higher up along the uh, flow line and you can get a heart attack. So I may have been lucky enough to have dense plaque in my arteries and maybe that's why I didn't give myself a heart attack. Um, so that's the story. It's complicated. Taint simple. Um, creatinine level is 1.7, type 2. Diet for kidney function is the opposite for that of type 2 diabetes. What does one do? Follow diet for kidney health or follow diet for type 2 diabetes health? Well, it ain't that simple. And this question has been asked over and over, and I've answered it over and over. Uh, in fact, uh, I just uh, came last night upon uh, an old article that uh, showed that when uh, uh, people who had end-stage kidney disease were uh, put on a low-protein diet, it was, there was a possibility that they might put off kidney dialysis by two or three months. That's when your kidneys are totally gone. But in the meanwhile, what's causing the kidney disease? The high blood sugars. And um, if you're going to continue the high blood sugars, you're certainly going to accelerate the progression of the kidney disease. And I also point out that I had pretty advanced kidney disease, again, back in 1969 when I started all of this. And uh, by normalizing my blood sugars, I reversed it. And uh, 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 as of today, my creatinine is still under one and I'm 82 years old. Next question. Oops, turned the page the wrong way, just a moment. Recently, there have been several reports of artificial sweeteners decreasing insulin sensitivity. Well, this is the same as that prior question, so I'm not going to um, answer it. Could you contrast the sequelae associated with low blood sugars versus the high blood sugars over a long time? I believe my blood sugars on the high end are much better, like 90 through 100, but still concerned about going low into the 50s once or twice during the week. Um, you might take a look at my book, uh, diabetes solution, but there's no doubt that the complications of elevated blood sugars go up uh, without a lower boundary. That is, once they become elevated. So above about 90 or 85, complications begin. Uh, and uh, they start off very slowly. You get above 100, they go more rapidly. Uh, 100, above 110, a little more rapidly. Um, 
what are the consequences of low blood sugar? The main consequences are if you uh, develop a seizure. Uh, it's been demonstrated a long time ago that every time a patient has a seizure, they develop micro hemorrhages. How many, I don't know. Uh, but um, if you did an autopsy on someone or if you did an angiogram uh, with the proper contrast medium, you could probably find with the new uh, high-resolution um, uh, brain scans, you could probably find these uh, micro uh, uh, hemorrhages and they will add up over time. Uh, but if you don't have seizures, it's unlikely that you're going to have uh, uh, any complications whatsoever. Uh, it's quite likely that our ancestors who had uh, uh, frequent famines uh, experienced low blood sugar without unconsciousness uh, pretty often. And hum humanity managed to survive that. Uh, part of it, of course, is due to the fact that the brain can live off ketones. That's a separate story altogether. Uh, so, uh, no seizure, no damage. Seizures, you get micro damage every time. And elevated blood sugars, you're under 100 or you're 110, they're going to be minimal. Uh, but they'll be a little bit over long periods of time. And that's, that's the story. You have higher blood sugars, they'll be more rapid. Type 1, 6 years. He has normal blood glucose levels almost all the time on your program. I say almost because when playing soccer, his blood sugar spikes from adrenaline. Any tips? Now, we've uh, done this before. Uh, I get this question every few months, and I'll repeat it again. The, the answer is propanolol, propanol, a beta blocker. It's a rapid-acting beta blocker. It's all right to give it to kids, and it miraculously prevents the blood sugar spikes that occur when you're exposed to stress. And kids who uh, uh, participate in team sports, especially when there's a competition between schools, uh, get very anxious, and the anxiety raises their blood sugar. Uh, there are adults who uh, are teachers, they get anxious when they teach. There are performers who are anxious when they perform, and the propranolol uh, prevents the blood sugar increase. Um, I had the same thing uh, after my first book came out. Uh, they started interviewing me on, my radio, on the radio, my blood sugars went up. I got used to it after a while, and the blood sugars didn't go up. I was not a doctor yet, so I couldn't prescribe propranolol. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> um, uh, I would give myself intramuscular shots to bring the blood sugar down. Um, but that's not necessary. Uh, when uh, I started getting on television, the same thing happened. I'd go up by 100 uh, just by appearing for 10 minutes before the cameras. Um, but after a while, I got used to it, and uh, they didn't go up. Uh, so, but in those days, I used intramuscular, uh, regular insulin to bring the blood sugars down. Not necessary. You could prevent it with propranolol. Your doctor can prescribe it. You can start with a very low dose, like 5 milligrams uh, every few hours, uh, and up it to 10, which is the usual dose. And even little kids can get away with 5 or 10 milligrams without problems. There may be exceptions. You check with your pediatrician. Let's see. I guess I have to... Huh. I guess I finished 
all the questions. Let me just... Uh, <clears throat> I just want to see the date of this publication. Okay. <clears throat> this is Dr. Bernstein of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Uh, our subject for today is orthostatic hypotension. A report recently came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in um, the May 2016 issue, May 64, uh, uh, volume 64, um, of a study of people who are falling due to unknown causes, usually elderly people. And um, what, what the study found was 40% of the supposed unknown causes of falling were orthostatic hypotension, that is, blood pressure that drops when you stand up. Now, this is very common amongst diabetics uh, because uh, they tend to, people with high blood sugars, tend to get autonomic neuropathy. And one of the autonomic neuropathies is sympathetic neuropathy of the lower extremities. This means that when you stand up, the, ar the muscles around the arteries in your legs that are supposed to squeeze the arteries closed so blood doesn't pool in your legs and deprive your brain of blood, uh, these arteries aren't working. They're, the muscles aren't working because the nerves to the muscles aren't working. So uh, a diabetic with autonomic neuropathy can stand up and pass out. Uh, his blood pressure drops dramatically. Now, it's interesting that when I was a medical student, I uh, rotated... Uh, on the medical wards, and the most common admission in our population, which was an elderly pop population, was uh, for people passing out. And nowhere in the protocol was there to check their blood pressure supine and standing. We were to get electrocardiographs, um, get exercise stress tests, um, electroencephalograms. They had a whole protocol that would take several days, very expensive, and none of these things were positive. Case after case, uh, they didn't find anything. Well, my patients, I would check their blood pressure, spine and standing, and uh, I'd always find they had orthostatic hypotension. Uh, when they stood up, not only did their blood pressure drop, but they complained of feeling dizzy, and some of them had to sit down right away. <laughs> so, uh, in my day, doctors were just not checking for this. And when I was doing it, I was ridiculed by the attending physicians. The same thing happened when I went into my internship, but I wasn't ridiculed as much. The other interns started cop copying me. Um, uh, so... Uh, this is just a reminder that if you uh, have orthostatic hypotension, uh, when you get up at night to pee or for any other reason, you sit at the edge of your bed and dangle your feet for about a minute and get up very slowly uh, because uh, you might fall over. And then if you're taking insulin, people will think you have hypoglycemia and they'll give you glucose and not realize that it was due to orthostatic hypotension. Um, uh, very important, in extreme cases, we'll have people wear surgical stockings, uh, 
maybe 20 to 30 millimeter compression, even when they're lying in bed. And in very extreme cases, people have to wear um, uh, surgical pantyhose going all the way up to their abdomen. Uh, it's very hard to get on and off and hard to pee and so on. But that, those are extreme cases, but these cases do exist. So it's a very important subject because it's very common. It, it also occurs in elderly people who are not diabetic. Thank. Uh, I stumbled upon a few interesting scientific articles. Here's another one. Uh, diabetes in midlife is associated with accelerated cognitive decline. Uh, and this was a study following people for 20 years. And it, it came out in the year 2014. But here's another article that uh, says, Elevated blood sugars linked to brain shrinkage. And uh, those with higher fasting blood sugar levels within the normal range and below 110 milligram per deciliter were more likely to have loss of brain volume in the areas of the hippocampus and the amygdala. Uh, those are areas that are associated with memory and cognitive still skills. And this was from uh, the journal Neurology in September of 2012. So there really is no doubt that the studies are overwhelming that elevated blood sugars, even slightly elevated as indicated in this study, have... Uh, very significant effects upon the brain. And there is one other interesting study, which is sort of hard to believe, but it was published, I think, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, let's see, when was this published? July 2016, no, 2015. Insulin detamir, that's levamir, is transported from blood to cerebrospinal fluid and has prolonged central anorectic action relative to NPH insulin. So uh, what that means is that it supposedly curbs your appetite. So one would think, at least theoretically, that levomere insulin uh, can be used to uh, prevent overeating. Now, I'm currently taking levomere insulin, and I don't recall ever having uh, much of an appetite. I've never been a big eater, uh, except when I was eight years old. And um, uh, I can't testify that the, it's the levomere that's uh, causing me to have uh, a very meager appetite. But it's something to think about, and it's something that uh, uh, patients or physicians might want to experiment with if they have uh, carbohydrate cravings or overeating or whatever. Uh, that's it for tonight. We may have finished a little early. Uh, the um, next episode of our teleseminars will be on Wednesday, July 27th. Uh, please join me then. Thanks for uh, listening tonight and uh, have a good month.